The Continued Story of Taryn, the Assistant Pig Keeper I'm glad you've stayed to listen. Now sit round as Papa Bear reads a story. Chapter 3. Gurgy By the time Taryn woke, Gwydion had already settled Melangar. The cloak Taryn had slept in was damp with dew. Every joint ached from his night on the hard ground. With Gwydion's urging, Taryn stumbled toward the horse, a white blur in the gray-pink dawn. Gwydion hauled Taryn into the saddle behind him, spoke a quiet command, and the white steed moved quickly into the rising mist. Gwydion was seeking the spot where Taryn had last seen Henwen. But long before they had reached it, he reined up Melangar and dismounted. As Taryn watched, Gwydion knelt and sighted along the turf. Luck is with us, he said. I think we have struck her trail. Gwydion pointed to a faint circle of trampled grass. Here, she slept, and not too long ago. He strode a few paces forward, scanning every broken twig and blade of grass. Despite Taryn's disappointment at finding the Lord Gwydion dressed in a coarse jacket and mud-spattered boots, he followed the man with growing admiration. Nothing, Taryn saw, escaped Gwydion's eyes. Like a lean, gray wolf, he moved silently and easily. A little way on, Gwydion stopped, raised his shaggy head, and narrowed his eyes toward a distant range. The trail is not clear, he said, frowning. I can only guess she might have gone down the slope. With all the forest to run in, Taryn queried, how can we begin to search? She might have gone anywhere in Brightain. Not quite, answered Gwydion. I may not know where she went, but I can be sure of where she did not go. He pulled a hunting knife from his belt. Here, I will show you. Gwydion knelt and quickly traced the lines in the earth. These are the Eagle Mountains, he said with a touch of longing in his voice. In my own land of the north here, great Avern flows. See how it turns west before it reaches the sea. We may have to cross it before our search ends. And this is the river Yistrad. Its valley leads north to Carrot Athel. Let's see here. Gwydion went on, pointing to the left of the line he had drawn for the river Yistrad. Here is Mount Dragon and the domain of Oron. Henwen would shove this above all. She would. She was too long a captive in Anuvan. She would never venture near it. Was Hen in Anuvan? Taran asked with surprise. But how? Long ago, Gwydion said. Henwen lived among the race of men. She belonged to a farmer who had no idea at all of her powers. And so she might have spent her days as an ordinary pig. But Oron knew her to be far from ordinary, and of such value that he himself rode out of Anuvan and seized her. What dire things happened while she was prisoner of Oron, it is better not to speak of them. Poor Hen, Taryn said. It must have been terrible for her, but how did she escape? She did not escape, said Gwydion. She was rescued. A warrior went alone into the depths of Anuvan and brought her back safely. That was a brave deed, Taryn cried. I wish that I... The bards of the north will still sing of it, Gwydion said. His name shall never be forgotten. Who was it? Taryn demanded. Gwydion looked closely at him. Do you not know? He asked. Dolben has neglected your education. It was Call, he said. Call, son of Kolfruer. Call, Taryn cried. Not the same. The same, said Gwydion. But, but, Taryn stammered. Call a hero? But he's, he's so bald. Gwydion laughed and shook his head. Assistant Big Keeper, he said, you have curious notions about heroes. I have never known courage to be judged by the length of a man's hair, or, for that matter, whether he has any hair at all. Crestfallen, Taryn peered at Gwydion's map and said no more. Here, continued Gwydion, not far from Anuvan lies Spiral Castle. This too Henwin would avoid at all cost. It is the abode of Queen Akron. She is as dangerous as Auron himself, as evil as she is beautiful. But there are secrets concerning Akron which are better left untold. I am sure, Gwydion went on, Henwin will not go toward Anuvan or Spiral Castle. From what little I can see, she has run straight ahead. Quickly now, we shall try to pick up her trail. Gwydion turned Melangar toward the ridge. As they reached the bottom of the slope, 
Terran heard the waters of Great Avarin rushing like wind in a summer storm. We must go again on foot, Gwydion said. Her tracks may show somewhere along here, so we had best move slowly and carefully. Stay close behind me, he ordered. If you start dashing ahead, and you seem to have that tendency, you will trample out any signs she may have left. Terran obediently walked a few paces behind. Gwydion made no more sound than the shadow of a bird. Melangar herself stopped quietly. Hardly a twig snapped underneath her hooves. Try as he would, Terran could not go as silently. The more careful he attempted to be, the louder the leaves rattled and crackled. Wherever he put his foot, there seemed to be a hole or spiteful branch to trip him up. Even Melangar turned and gave him a reproachful look. Terran grew so absorbed in not making noise that he soon lagged far behind Gwydion. On the slope, Terran believed he could make out something round and white. He yearned to be the first to find Henwind, and he turned aside, clambered through the weeds to discover nothing more than a boulder. Disappointed, Terran hastened to catch up with Gwydion. Overhead, the branches rustled. As he stopped and looked up, something fell heavily to the ground behind him. Two hairy and powerful hands locked around his throat. Whatever had seized him made barking and snorting noises. Terran forced out a cry for help. He struggled with his unseen opponent, twisting and flailing his legs, throwing himself from side to the side. Suddenly, he could breathe again. A shape sailed over his head and crashed against the tree trunk. Terran dropped to the ground and began rubbing at his neck. Gwydion stood beside him. Sprawled under the tree was the strangest creature Terran had ever seen. He could not be sure whether it was animal or human. He decided it was both. Its hair was so matted and covered with leaves that it looked like an owl's nest in need of house cleaning. It had long, skinny, woolly arms and a pair of feet as flexible and grimy as its hands. Gwydion was watching the creature with a look of severity and annoyance. So it is you, he said. I ordered you not to hinder me or anyone under my protection. At this, the creature set up a loud and piteous whining, rolled its eyes, and beat the ground with his palms. It is only Gurji, Gwydion said. He is always lurking about one place or another. He is not half as ferocious as he looks, nor a quarter as fierce as he should like to be, and more a nuisance than anything else. Somehow, he manages to see most of what happens, and he might just be able to help us. Terran had just begun to catch his breath. He was covered with Gurji's shedding hair, in addition to the distressing odor of a wet wolfhound. Oh, mighty priest! The creature wailed. Gurji is sorry, and now he will be smacked on his poor tender head by the strong hands of this great lord, with fearsome smackings. Yes, yes, that is always the way of it with poor Gurji. But what honor to be smacked by the greatest of warriors. I have no intention of smacking your poor tender head, Gwydion, said Gwydion. But I may change my mind if you do not leave off with that winding and sniveling. Yes, powerful lord, Gurji cried. See how he obeys rapidly and instantly. He began crawling about on hands and knees with great agility. Had Gurji owned a tail, Terran was sure he would have wagged it frantically. Then, Gurji pleaded, the two strengthful heroes will give Gurji something to eat? Oh, joyous crunchings and munchings. Afterward, said Gwydion, when you have answered our questions. Oh, afterward, cried Gurji. Poor Gurji can wait long, long time for his crunchings and munchings. Many years from now, when the great princes revel in their halls with feastings, they will remember hungry, wretched Gurji waiting for them. How long for you wait for your crunchings and munchings, said Gwydion, depends on how quickly you tell us what we want to know. Have you seen a white pig this morning? A crafty look gleamed in Gurji's close-set little eyes. For the seeking of a piggy, there are many great lords in the forest, riding with frightening shouts. They would not be cruel to starving Gurji. Oh no, they would feed him. They would have your head off your shoulders before you could think twice about it, Gwydion said. Did one of them wear an antlered mask? Yes, yes, Gurji cried. The great horns. You will have saved miserable, miserable Gurji from hurtful choppings? He set up a long and dreadful howling. I am losing patience with you, warned Gwydion. 
Where is the pig? Guji hears these mighty riders, the creature went on. Oh yes, with careful listenings from the trees, Guji is so quiet and clever, and no one hears or cares about him. But he listens, he listens. These great warriors say they have gone to a certain place, but great fire turns them away. They are not pleased, and they still seek a piggy with outcries and horses. Guji, said Gurdian firmly, where is the pig? The piggy? Oh, terrible hunger pinches. Gurji cannot remember. Was there a piggy? Gurji is fainting and falling into the bushes. His poor tender head is full of air from his empty belly. Terran could no longer control his impatience. Where is Henwen, you stupid, silly, hairy thing? He burst out. Tell us, straight off. After the way you jumped on me, you deserve to have your head smacked. With a moan, Gurji rolled over on his back and covered his head with his arms. Gwydion turned severely to Terran. Had you followed my orders, you would not have been jumped on. Leave him to me. Do not make him any more frightened than he already is. Gwydion looked down at Gurji. Very well, he said calmly. Where is she? Oh, fearful wrath, Gurji snuffled. A piggy has gone across the water with swimmings and splashings. He sat upright and waved a woolly arm toward Great Avern. If you are lying to me, said Gwydion, I shall soon find out. Then I will surely come back, and with great wrath. Crunchings and munchings now, mighty prince? asked Gurji in a high, tiny whimper. As I promised you, said Gwydion. Gurji wants the smaller ones for munchings, said the creature with a beady glance at Terran. No, you do not, Gwydion said. He is an assistant pig keeper, and he would disagree with you, violently. He unbuckled a saddlebag and pulled out a few strips of dried meat, which he tossed to Gurji. Be off now. Remember, I want no mischief from you. Gurji snatched the food, thrust it between his teeth, and scuttled up a tree trunk, leaping from tree to tree until he was out of sight. What a disgusting beast, said Terran. What a nasty, vicious, violent... Oh, he's not bad at heart. Gwydion answered. He would love to be wicked and terrifying, though he cannot quite manage it. He feels so sorry for himself that it is hard not to be angry for him. But there is no use in doing so. Was he telling the truth about Henwen? asked Terran. I think he was, Gwydion said. It is as I feared. The Horned King has ridden to Caer Dolben. He burned it, Terran cried. Until now, he had paid little mind to his home. The thought of the white cottage in flames his memory of Dalbin's beard and the heroic Call's bald head touched him all at once. Dalbin and Call, they're in peril. Surely not, said Gwydion. Dalbin is an old fox. A beetle could not creep into Kara Dalbin without his knowledge. No, I am certain the fire was something Dalbin arranged for unexpected visitors. And when is the one in greatest peril? Our quest grows ever more urgent. Gwydion hastily continued. The Horned King knows she is missing. He will pursue her. Then, Terran cried, we must find her before he does. Assistant Pig Keeper, said Gwydion, that has been so far your only sensible suggestion. Chapter 4. The Gwythanes. Melangar bore them swiftly through the fringe of trees, lining Great Avern's sloping banks. They dismounted and hurried on foot in the direction Gurji had indicated. Near a jagged rock, Gwydion halted and gave a cry of triumph. In a patch of clay, Henwen's tracks showed as plainly as if they had been carved. Good for Gurji, exclaimed Gwydion. I hope he enjoys his crunchings and munchings. Had I known he would guide us so well, I would have given him an extra stare. Yes, she crossed here, he went on, and we shall do the same. Gwydion led Melangar forward. The air had suddenly grown cold and heavy. The restless Avran ran gray, slashed with white streaks. Clutching Melangar's saddle horn, Terran stepped gingerly from the bank. Gwydion strode directly into the water. Terran, thinking it easier to get wet a little at time, hung back as much as he could until Melangar lunged ahead, carrying him with her. His feet sought the river bottom. He stumbled and splashed, while icy waves swirled up to his neck. The current drew stronger, coiling like a gray serpent around Terran's legs. The bottom dropped away sharply. 
Terran lost its footing and found himself wildly dancing over nothing, as if the river was seizing him greedily. Melangar began to swim, her strong legs keeping her afloat and in motion. But the current swung her around. She collided with Terran and forced him under the water. Let go of the saddle, Gwydion shouted above the torrent. Swim clear of her. Water flooded Terran's ears and nostrils. With every gasp, the river poured into his lungs. Gwydion struck out after him, soon overtook him, seized him, seized him by the hair, and drew him towards the shallows. He heaved the dripping, coughing Terran onto the bank. Melangar, reaching the shore a little further upstream, trotted down to join them. Gwydion looked sharply at Terran. I told you to swim clear. Our old assistant pig keeper is deaf as well as stubborn. Well, I don't know how to swim, Terran cried, his teeth chattering violently. Then why did you not say so before we started across the large river? Gwydion asked angrily. I was sure I could learn. Terran protested. As soon as I came to do it, if Melangar hadn't sat on me. You must learn to answer for your own folly, said Gwydion. As for Melangar, she is wiser now than you can ever hope to become, and even should you live to be a man, which seems more and more unlikely. <clears throat> Gwydion swung into the saddle and pulled up the soaking, bedraggled Terran. Melangar's hooves clicked over the stones. Terran, snuffling and shivering, looked toward, towards the waiting hill. High against the blue, three-winged shapes wheeled and glided. Gwydion, whose eyes were everywhere at once, caught sight of them instantly. Quithanes, he cried, and turned Melangar sharply to the right, the abrupt change in direction. And Melangar's heavy burst of speed threw Terran off balance. His legs flew up, and he landed flat on the pebble-strewn bank. Gwydion reined in Melangar immediately. Old Terran struggled to his feet. Gwydion seized him like a sack of meal and hauled him to Melangar's back. The Gwythanes, which, at a distance, had seemed no more than dry leaves in the wind, grew larger and larger. As they plunged towards horse and rider, downward they swooped, their great black wings driving them ever faster. Melangar clattered up the riverbank. The Gwythanes screamed above. At the line of trees, Gwydion thrust Terran from the saddle and leaped down. Dragging him along, Gwydion dropped to the earth under an oak tree's spreading branches. The glittering wings beat against the foliage. Terran glimpsed curving beaks and talons, merciless as daggers. He cried out in terror and hid his face as the Gwythanes veered off and swooped again. The leaves rattled in their wake. The creatures swung upward, hung poised against the sky for an instant, then climbed swiftly and sped westward. White-faced and trembling, Terran ventured to raise his head. Gwydion strode to the riverbank and stood watching the Gwythanes flee. Terran made his way to his companion's side. I had hoped this would not happen, Gwydion said. His face was dark and grave. Thus far, I've been able to avoid them. Terran said nothing. He had clumsily fallen off Malangar at the moment when speed counted most. At the oak, he had behaved like a child. He waited for Gwydion's rubber man, but the warrior's green eyes followed the dark specks. Sooner or later, they would have found us, Gwydion said. They are Oron spies and messengers, the eyes of Anuvin, they are called. No one stays at long hidden from them. We are lucky they were only scouting and not on a blood hunt. He turned away as the Gwythanes at last disappeared. Now they fly to their iron cages in Anuvin, he said. Oron himself will have news of us before this day ends. He will not be idle. If only they hadn't seen us, Terran moaned. There is no use regretting what has happened said Gwydion as they set out again. One way or another, Oron would learn of us. I have no doubt he knew the moment I rode from Caradathel. The Gwythanes are not his only servants. I think they must be the worst, said Terran, quickening his pace to keep up with Gwydion. Far from it, said Gwydion. The errand of the Gwythanes is less to kill than to bring information. For generations they have been trained in this. Oron understands this language, and they are in his power from the moment they leave the egg. Nevertheless, they are creatures of flesh and blood, and a sword can answer them. There are others to whom a sword means nothing. Gwydion said, Among them, the cauldron-born, who serve Auron as warriors. Are they not men? Terran asked. They were, once, replied Gwydion. They are the dead, 
whose bodies are on steels from their resting places in the long barrows. It is said he steeps them in a cauldron to give them life again, it can, if it can be called life. Like death, they are forever silent, and their only thought is to bring others to the same bondage. Oron keeps them as his guards in Anuvin, for their power wanes the longer and farther they have been from their master. Yet from time to time, Oron sends them, sends certain of them outside Anuvin to perform his most ruthless of tasks. These cauldron, cauldron born are utterly without mercy or pity, Gwydion continued, for Oron has worked still greater evil upon them. He has destroyed their remembrance of themselves as living men. They have no memory of tears or laughter, of sorrow or loving kindness. Among all Oron's deeds, this one is the cruelest. After much searching, Gwydion discovered Hanwen's tracks once more. They led over a barren field, then to a shallow ravine. Here they stop, he said, frowning. Even on stony ground, there should be some trace, but I can see nothing. Slowly and painstakingly, he quartered the land on either side of the ravine. The weary and discouraged Terran could barely force himself to put one foot in front of the other, and was glad the dusk obliged Gwydion to halt. Gwydion tethered Melangar in a thicket. Terran sank to the ground and rested his head in his hands. She has disappeared too completely, said Gwydion, bringing provisions from the saddlebag. Many things could have happened. Time is too short to ponder each one. What can we do, then? Terran asked fearfully. Is there no way to search for her? The surest search is not always the shortest, said Gwydion, and we may not need the help of other hands before it is done. There is an ancient dweller in the foothills of Eagle Mountains. His name is Medwin, and he said, it is said he understands the hearts and ways of every creature in praying. He, if anyone, should know where Hanwen may be hiding. If we could find him, Terran began. You go right in saying if, Gwydion answered. I have never seen him. Others have sought him and failed. We should have only faint hope. But that is better than none at all. A wind had risen, whispering among the black cluster of trees. From a distance came the lowly bang of hounds. Gwydion sat upright, tense as a bowstring. Is it the horned king? cried Terran. Has he followed us this closely? Gwydion shook his head. No, no hounds bell like those, save the pack of Gwyn the hunter. And so, he mused, Gwyn too rides abroad. Another of Oron's servants, asked Terran, his voice betraying his anxiety. Gwyn owes allegiance to a lord unknown even to me, Gwydion answered, and one perhaps greater than Oron. Gwyn the hunter rides alone with his dogs, and where he rides, slaughter follows. He has fallen at foreknowledge of death and battle, and watches from afar, marking the fall of warriors. Above the cry of the pack rose the long, clear notes of a hunting horn. Flung across the sky, the sound pierced Terran's breast like a cold blade of terror. Yet unlike the music itself, the echoes from the hills sang less of fear than of grief. Fading, they sighed that sunlight and birds, bright mornings, warm fires, food and drink, friendship, and all good things had been lost beyond recovery. Gwydion laid a hand on Terran's brow. Gwyn's music is a warning, Gwydion said. Take it as a warning, for whatever profit that knowledge may be. But do not listen overmuch to the echoes. Others have done so, and have wandered hopelessly ever since. A whinny from Melangar broke Terran's sleep. As Gwydion rose and went to her, Terran glimpsed a shadow dart behind a brush. He sat up quickly. Quidian's back was turned. In the bright moonlight, the shadow moved again. Choking back his fear, Terran leaped to his feet and plunged into the under the growth. Thorns tore at him. He landed on something that grappled frantically with him. He lashed out, seized what felt like someone's head, and an unmistakable odor of wet wolfhound assailed his nose. Gurgy! Terran cried furiously. You sneaking! Little the creature curled into an awkward ball as Terran began shaking him. Enough, enough, he called. Do not frighten the wits out of the poor thing. Save your own life next time, Terran retorted angrily to Gwydion, while Gurchy began howling at the top of his voice. I should have known a great war leader needs no help from an assistant pig keeper. 
Unlike assistant pig keepers, Gwydion said gently, I scorn the help of no man, and you should know better than to jump into thorn bushes without first making sure what you will find. Save your anger for a better purpose. He hesitated and looked carefully at Taryn. Why, I believe you did think my life was in danger. If I had only known it was that stupid, silly Gurji. The fact is, you did not, Gwydion said, so I shall take the intention for the deed. You may be many other things, Taren of Caradalbin, but I see you are no coward. I offer you my thanks, he offered, bowing deeply. And what of poor Gurji, howled the creature. No thanks for him, oh no, only smackings by great lords, not even the small munching for helping find a piggy. We didn't find any piggy, Taren replied angrily. And if you ask me, you know too much about the Horned King. I wouldn't be surprised if you'd gone and told him. No, no. The Lord of the Great Horns pursues wise, miserable Gurji with leapings and gallopings. Gurji fears terrible smackings and whackings. He follows kindly and mighty protectors. Faithful Gurji will not leave them, never. And what of the Horned King? Gwydion asked quickly. Oh, very angry, whined Gurji. Wicked lords ride with mumblings and grumblings because they cannot find a piggy. Where are they now? asked Gwydion. Not far. They cross water, but only clever, unthanked Gurji knows where. And they light fires with fearsome blazings. Can you lead us to them? Gwydion asked. I would learn their place. Gurji whimpered questioningly. Crunchings and munchings? I knew he would get around to that, said Taren. Gwydion saddled Melangar, and clinging to the shadows, they set out across the moonlit hills. Gurji led the way, loping ahead, bent forward, his long arms dangling. They crossed one deep valley, then another, before Gurji halted on a ridge. Below the wide plain blazed with torches, and Terran saw a great ring of flames. Crunchings and munchings now? Gurji suggested. Disregarding him, Quidian motioned for them all to descend the slope. There was little need for silence. A deep, hollow drumming throbbed over the crowded plain. Horses wickered. There came the shouts of men and the clank of weapons. Gwydion crouched in the bracken, watching intently. Around the fiery circle, warriors on high stilts beat upraised swords against their shields. What are those men? Terran whispered. And the wicker baskets hanging from the posts? They are proud walkers, Gwydion answered, in a dance of battle. An ancient rite of war from the days where men were no more than savages. The baskets, another ancient custom, best forgotten. But look there, Gwydion cried suddenly, the horned king. And there, he exclaimed, pointing to the column of horsemen, I see the banners of Cantrev Rigad, the banners of Dub, Daugladen, and of Maur, all the Cantrevs of the south. Yes, now I understand. Before Gwydion could speak again, the horned king, bearing a torch, rode to the wicker baskets and thrust the fire into them. Flames seized the osier cages. Billows of foul smoke rose skyward. The warriors clashed their shields and shouted together with one voice. From the baskets rose the agonized screams of men. Terran gasped and turned away. We have seen enough, Gwydion ordered. Hurry, let us be gone from here. Dawn had broken when Quidian halted at the edge of a barren field. Until now, he had not spoken. Even Gurji had been silent, his eyes round with terror. This is a part of what I have journeyed so far to learn, Quidian said. His face was grim and pale. Auron now dares try force of arms. With the Horned King as his war leader, the Horned King has raised a mighty host, and they will march against us. The sons of Dawn are ill prepared for so powerful an enemy. They must be warned. I must return to Cairdathel immediately. From a corner of woodland, five mounted warriors cantered into the field. Terran sprang up. The first horseman spurred his mount to a gallop. Melangar whinnied shrilly. The warriors drew their shields. And this concludes the fourth chapter of Terran's tale. I will continue the next chapter in the next episode. Thank you for watching, and remember, have a good day. You deserve it.